This episode of Real Engineering is brought to you by Skillshare, home to over 20,000 classes that could teach you a new life skill. As the world grapples to eliminate fossil fuels from our energy diet, electric cars have seen an incredible boom over the past few years. Last year, over 1 million electric cars were sold around the world. The number of Nissan Leafs, Teslas and other electric vehicles in circulation worldwide is now more than 3 million. And while there are many brands of electric car to choose from, there are only two choices when it comes to powering electric vehicles, fuel cells or batteries. Both produce electricity to drive electric motors, eliminating the pollution and inefficiencies of the fossil fuel powered internal combustion engine. Both hydrogen and electricity for batteries can be produced from low or zero carbon sources, including renewable energy like solar and wind, and therefore both are being pursued by car manufacturers and researchers as the possible future of electric vehicles. However, a great debate is being waged by supporters of each technology. Elon Musk has called hydrogen fuel cell technology incredibly dumb, claiming they're more of a marketing ploy for automakers than a long-term solution. In contrast, Japan has announced its intention to become the world's first hydrogen society, with the Japanese government and the auto industry working together to introduce 160 hydrogen stations and 40,000 fuel cell vehicles by March 2021. So which is actually better? At first glance, hydrogen seems like an extremely clever way to power a car. Compressed hydrogen has a specific energy of nearly 40,000 watt hours per kilogram. Lithium ion batteries at best have a specific energy of just 278 watt hours per kilogram, but most fall around 167. That's 236 times as much energy per kilogram for hydrogen. And because of its energy density and lightweight nature, Compressed hydrogen and fuel cells can power cars for extended ranges without adding much weight, which as we saw in our last video, is a gigantic roadblock for incorporating the technology into the aviation industry. The designers of electric vehicles are caught in a catch-22 with energy density and range. Each extra kilogram of battery weight to increase range requires extra structural weight, heavier brakes, a higher torque motor, and in turn, more batteries to carry around this extra mass. This weight compounding limits how far a battery powered vehicle can travel until new technology can help reduce the weight of the batteries. For hydrogen vehicles, this weight compounding is not an issue. Additionally, a hydrogen fuel cell vehicle can be refueled in under five minutes, where a battery powered electric vehicle like a Tesla Model S takes over three hours to fully recharge. When looking at the range and refuel times hydrogen can offer, you can see why some car manufacturers are investing in this technology. On the face of it, Hydrogen is a clear winner, but it falls behind when we start considering the end-to-end -end production process. While both batteries and hydrogen fuel cells are both forms of electricity storage, the costs differ drastically. Fully charging a Tesla Model 3 with a 75 kilowatt hour battery costs between $10 and $12 depending where you live. With a rated range of 500 kilometers, that's between 2 and 2.4 cent per kilometer, a great price. In a previous video, I visited a petrol station that introduced a hydrogen pump fed by its own on-site production facility, which used off-peak electricity to produce hydrogen. The hydrogen from this station cost $85 to fill a 5 kilogram tank of the Toyota Morais on site, which had a range of 480 kilometers. That's 17.7 .7 cent per kilometer, eight times the price. And here lies the problem. Hydrogen simply requires more energy to produce. To understand the economic viability of hydrogen, let's dig deeper into the production process. Before any hydrogen vehicle can hit the road, you first need to produce the hydrogen. But hydrogen is not a readily available energy source. Even though hydrogen is the most abundant element in the universe, it is usually stored in water, hydrocarbons such as methane and other organic matter. One of the challenges of using hydrogen as an energy storage mechanism comes from being able to efficiently extract it from these compounds. In the United States, the majority of hydrogen is produced through a process called steam reforming. Steam reforming is the process of combining high temperature steam with natural gas to extract hydrogen. While steam reforming is the most common method of industrial hydrogen production, it requires a good deal of heat and is wildly inefficient. Hydrogen produced by steam reforming actually has less energy than the natural gas that the steam reforming began with. And while hydrogen fuel cells themselves don't produce pollution, this process does. So if we want to assume a future scenario with as little carbon emission as possible, this method won't cut it. Another method to produce hydrogen is electrolysis, separating the hydrogen out of water using an electric current. While the electricity needed for this process can be provided by renewable sources, 
it requires more energy input than steam reforming. You end up losing 30% of the energy from the original energy you put in from the renewables when you carry out electrolysis. So we are sitting at 70% energy efficiency from hydrogen fuel cells if traditional electrolysis is used before the car even starts its engine. A slightly more efficient method of producing hydrogen is polymer exchange membrane electrolysis. Using this method, energy efficiencies can reach up to 80%, with the added benefit of being produced on site, which we will get to in a moment. But this is still a 20% loss of energy from the original electricity from the renewables. Some experts say the efficiency of PEM electrolysis is expected to reach 82 to 86% before 2030, which is a great improvement, but still well short of the battery's charging efficiency at 99%. A 19% difference in production costs doesn't explain the difference in costs yet, so where else are we losing energy? The next hurdle in getting hydrogen fuel cell vehicles on the road is the transport and storage of the pure hydrogen. If we assume the hydrogen is produced on site, like it was for this petrol station, then we eliminate one energy sink. But the cost of storage is just as problematic. Hydrogen is extremely low density as a gas and liquid, and so in order to achieve adequate energy density, we have to increase its actual density. We can do this in two ways. We can compress the hydrogen to 790 times atmospheric pressure, but that takes energy, about 13% of the total energy content of the hydrogen itself. Alternatively, we can turn hydrogen into liquid cryogenically. The advantage of hydrogen liquefaction is that a cryogenic hydrogen tank is much lighter than a tank that can hold pressurized hydrogen. But again, hydrogen's physical properties means hydrogen is harder to liquefy than any other gas except helium. Hydrogen is liquefied by reducing its temperature to minus 250 degrees Celsius, with an efficiency loss of 40% once you factor in the added weight of the refrigerators and the refrigeration itself, so pressurization is a better option at a 13% energy loss. Once the hydrogen is produced and compressed to a liquid or gas, a viable hydrogen infrastructure requires that hydrogen be able to be delivered from where it's produced to the point of end use, such as a vehicle refueling station. Where the hydrogen is produced can have a big impact on the cost and best method of delivery. For example, a large centrally located hydrogen production facility can produce hydrogen at a lower cost because it is producing more, but it costs more to deliver the hydrogen because the point of use is further away. In comparison, distributed production facilities produce hydrogen on site, so delivery costs are relatively low, but the cost to produce the hydrogen is likely to be higher because the production volumes are less. While there are some small-scale, on-site hydrogen production facilities being installed at refueling pumps, such as the station mentioned in my last hydrogen video, until this infrastructure is widespread, we have to assume that the majority of hydrogen is being transported by truck or pipeline, where we know that the energy losses can range from 10% up to 40%. In comparison, assuming that the electricity we use for charging the batteries comes from completely renewable resources, we just have to consider the transmission losses in the grid. Using the United States grid as a reference for typical grid losses, the average loss is only 5%. So in the best case scenario for hydrogen, using the most efficient means of production and transport, we lose 20% of energy during PEM electrolysis and around 13% for compression and storage, amounting to a 33% loss. In other systems, this could be as much as 56%. For battery power up to this point, we've lost just 6% to the grid and recharging bringing our best case efficiency difference to 27% and our worst case to 50%. The next stage of powering electric vehicles is what is called the tank to wheel conversion efficiency. For hydrogen fuel vehicles, once the hydrogen is in the tank, it must be reconverted into electric power. This is done via a fuel cell, which essentially works like a PEM electrolyzer, but in reverse. In a PEM fuel cell, hydrogen gas flows through channels to an anode, where a catalyst causes the hydrogen molecules to separate into protons and electrons. Once again, the membrane only allows protons to pass through it, while electrons flow through an external circuit to the cathode. This flow of electrons is the electricity that is used to power the vehicle's electric motors. If the fuel cell is powered with pure hydrogen, it has the potential to be around 60% efficient, with most of the wasted energy lost to heat. Like hydrogen fuel cells, batteries come with inefficiencies and energy losses. The grid provides AC current while the batteries store the charge in DC, so to convert AC to DC, we need a charger. Using the Tesla Model S as an example, its peak charger efficiency is around 92%. The Tesla Model S runs on AC motors, 
Therefore, to convert the DC current supplied by the batteries to AC current, an inverter has to be used with an efficiency of roughly 90%. Additionally, lithium ion batteries can lose energy due to leakage. A good estimate for the charging efficiency of a lithium ion battery is 90%. All of these factors combined lead to a total efficiency of around 75%. However, hydrogen fuel cell vehicles have some of these same inefficiencies. Any kind of electrolysis requires DC current, and therefore a rectifier will be required to convert the AC current from the grid to DC. The conversion efficiency here is 92%. We also need to convert the DC current produced by the fuel cell to AC current to power the motor through an inverter with an efficiency of 90%. Finally, the efficiency of the motor must be considered for both the fuel cell and battery powered vehicles. Currently, this is around 90 to 95% for both, which is amazing when you consider that internal combustion engines running on petrol have an efficiency of only around 20 to 30%. If we add up all these inefficiencies and compare current generation batteries to the best and worst case scenario for current gen hydrogen, we can see how they measure up. Even with the best case scenario, not taking into account any transport due to on-site production, and assuming very high electrolysis efficiency of 80%, and assuming a high fuel cell efficiency of 80%, hydrogen still comes out at less than half the efficiency. The worst case scenario is even worse off. So while you may be able to go further on one fill up of hydrogen in your fuel cell vehicle over a battery powered electric vehicle, the cost that is needed to deliver that one fill up would be astronomically higher compared to charging batteries due to these energy losses and inefficiencies. Based on our worst case scenario, we could expect the cost per kilometer to be about 3.5 times greater for hydrogen. But as we saw earlier, it's actually eight times the price. So additional cost of production unrelated to efficiencies are obviously at play. The cost of construction of the facility is one and the profit the station will take from the sale is another. For now, these inefficiencies and costs are driving the market, where most investment and research is going into battery-powered electric vehicles. So which wins? Both are equally more green than internal combustion engines, assuming equal renewable resources are used to power them. Fuel cells allow for fast fill-up times and long ranges, a big advantage, but battery-powered vehicles might catch up in range by the time there are enough hydrogen stations to make fuel cell vehicles viable. While fuel cells are efficient relative to combustion engines, they are not as efficient as batteries. They may make more sense for operation disconnected from the grid, or as we saw in our last video, using hydrogen for planes actually could make a lot of sense, but once again, that's a topic for another video. For now, battery powered electric vehicles seem to be the sensible choice going forward in the quest for pollution free consumer transport. As battery powered cars become more common, we're also starting to see self driving cars become the norm. If the job of the driver is slowly automated away and consumers have a bunch of free time to read or watch online video, it may be wise to use that opportunity to start learning new skills and Skillshare is a great place to do it. You could take this course on Photoshop for beginners and learn a skill that has helped this channel immensely. You may have noticed we introduced the new thumbnail design for the channel. This was done in part because the channel views were trending downwards for the past two months, despite putting extra effort into production quality. We needed to rethink our strategy for branding and I felt the blueprint's strength was that it was easily recognizable as mine, but they also look so similar it's difficult to tell when there is a new video out. So we got to work in Photoshop to use the strengths of the blueprint design and build on its weaknesses, and we came up with this transitioning effect, taking designs to reality, which I think fits perfectly with the theme of the channel. We saw immediate effects with the views on our last video jumping 80% compared to our past two month average. This is the power of illustration and you can learn how to use software like Photoshop and Illustrator on Skillshare. These days you can teach yourself pretty much any skill online and Skillshare is a fantastic place to do it. With over 20,000 classes ranging from animation, electronics, programming and much more. The classes follow a clear learning curve so you can just click and watch without having to curate your own learning experience. A premium membership begins around $10 a month for unlimited access to all courses but the first 1,000 people to sign up with this link will get their first two months for free. So ask yourself right now, what skill have you been putting off learning? What project have you been dreaming of completing but you aren't sure if you have the skills to do it? Why not start right now and sign up to Skillshare using the link below to get your first two months for free. You've nothing to lose and a valuable life skill to gain. As usual, thanks for watching and thank you to all my Patreon supporters. If you'd like to see more from me, the links to my Twitter, Facebook, Discord server, subreddit and Instagram pages are below. 
I'm about to do a Q&A on the subject matter of this video on my Instagram stories. So if you're interested in having some of your questions answered, the link for that is below.